modifying 5-inch gauge Great Western Railway 14XX steam locomotive and in this clip you see me painting the locomotive. I'm just touching in with some black paint the bright shiny bolts that are visible. Most of them are stainless steel which is a good thing they're not going to rust away but having shiny stainless steel bolts dotted around the engine is not really a good look. I do a bit of work at a place called the Steam Workshop. You've probably seen the videos that I make when I'm there. Quite a lot of the miniature steam locomotives in the Steam Workshop are what could be called super scale models, very accurate to the full size, just smaller. This engine on the other hand, although it captures the essence in my opinion of a Great Western Railway 14XX locomotive, is a long long way from being super scale, but in its own way, the general appearance and the quality of most of the parts is quite good. If you watched the last episode, you will notice that I had to modify the lamp brackets to take a super scale lamp. There are actually nine of these on the engine, three at the front, three down the side that I'm currently painting, one on top of the smoke box, and two at the back mounted on the superstructure for the tail lamps. In this clip I'm painting the top part of the two countersunk bolts that hold the footstep in place. These are some bolts that I fitted to replace the originals. The keeper plates underneath the axle boxes on the rear set of trailing wheels also were held in place by these stainless steel bolts which I'm currently painting. And this by the way is a second coat, sometimes it takes more than one coat because the paint is very very thin. You have to concentrate when doing this job because it doesn't look good if you splat the paint all over the part that is black already. It's not difficult, you just need a very steady hand and quite a fine good quality paintbrush especially on the smaller bolt heads, and here you see me painting one of the very small bolts. In this clip you may have noticed that I've turned the engine round because I'm painting the bolts on the other side now, and in exactly the same way as on the other side, I'm painting the two stainless steel bolts that hold the keeper plate in place underneath the axle box on the trailing wheels. Ever since I got the engine, these bright bolts have really bothered me, and so now I'm getting rid of the brightness just by painting them over particularly this set that are fitted to all four corners of the locomotive. Quite a few people are asking me, where did you buy this engine, who did you buy it from, and how much was it? I'll answer them in order. So first of all, where did I buy it from? I've already described that in a couple of previous videos. I bought it from the manufacturing company in China, and I'm not going to give those details out because I'm sure the manufacturer in China doesn't want to be inundated with emails from the viewers of my videos. And as to how much did it cost? Well, let's just say that's between me and my sawn off shotgun and the local post office. Moving on now, before I incriminate myself, it's time to remove the fittings from the boiler, starting with the firehole doors. Although these firehole doors are quite well made, they don't work properly, and this is one of the features of this type of engine, unfortunately, but they can be made to work with a bit of patience and a small amount of time and effort. More about this shortly. Personally, I couldn't wait to get rid of this turret. This turret is an abomination. So here I am removing it. It's a little bit like a banjo union, but it's not as good as a banjo union. And when Phil from Blackgates Engineering and myself first steamed this engine, this part leaked. Oh, and the water gauge leaked as well. And the clacks didn't work. All of the steam fittings are fitted into the boiler using a really strange type of sealant. It's very hard and very brittle and doesn't appear to do the job. Here I'm removing the blowpipe and if you have a close look at it you will see that the union cones are entirely different to the type that we use in England. Another thing that in my opinion is entirely wrong is the water gauge, so I'm taking it apart. I don't wish to be too picky with everything on this engine, I'm not purposely knocking Chinese manufacture because most of the time it's very good. Some of the parts I use in my recording studio are beautifully made just like some parts of this engine. Back to the water gauge. Here I'm removing the glass and this is a piece of glass that Phil and I fitted because the original one was cracked and the water gauge leaked badly as I just said. The main problem with this water gauge is its physical size. It's more the size of water gauge fitted to a seven and a quarter inch gauge engine and in my opinion on this semi-scale five inch gauge model locomotive it looks ridiculous. So I'm removing it and I'm going to replace it with one that looks, dare I say it, more scale. Once again, all of these fittings are covered in this sort of cement stuff. I don't know what it is, but as you can see, it's very brittle. Here I'm scraping it off with a screwdriver. And around this large hexagon fitting, which does leak a little bit as well, 
you can see once again I'm scraping it off with a screwdriver. So I really don't understand the logic of using this stuff because it certainly isn't a good sealant. Sealants should remain semi-flexible and that way they seal the threads and not hard and brittle like this stuff. This clack or check valve that I've just removed is one that I fitted and a quick word about threads. I assumed that most of the threads in the bushes on this boiler were going to be metric and indeed I really think they are. I had a word with John Holroyd who works at the steam workshop and is an incredibly talented model engineer and I asked John if he'd kindly check me some thread sizes because he is a bit of a walking encyclopedia. I was puzzled because my fittings are 5 sixteenths by 32 and these fittings that I buy from Blackgate's Engineering are actually made in England. 5 sixteenths by 32 threads per inch is not generally known to be metric but nevertheless it does screw into the boiler bush and it's okay. John looked on a chart of thread pictures and said, well yes, it's near enough really. Apparently it's some sort of metric fine thread. Maybe it's the Chinese version of 5 16 by 32. Right, it's time to remove this fire hole door and fix it. You can see the marks on the fire hole ring and this is caused by the bolts that hold the fire hole doors to the levers being too long, sticking out too far and catching the fire hole ring. Well that's an easy fix, just shorten the bolts. Now with all the boiler fittings and the fire hole door assembly removed, I can wire brush the back head. For two reasons, I'm going to paint the back head, so I'm keying it for the paint, but I'm getting rid of every trace of this strange sealant that's been used on the bushes. In this clip, I'm using a small twist drill just to make sure that the holes in these bushes don't go all the way through into the boiler. These are the threaded mounting holes for the bolts that hold the fire hole door assembly in place. When Phil and I steamed this engine up at Blackgate's Engineering it was okay, but when I ran it on the bench using compressed air, there was a very small leak from around this fitting. This large hexagon mounting for the gland assembly for the regulator is not the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, and as it's fitted with a copper washer, I just applied one of my larger barco spanners to it and managed to tighten it ever so slightly as I showed in the previous clip. As I said, the fix on the firehole door was simple. Using my linisher, or belt sander as it's more commonly known, I just ground off the protruding part of the bolts on the other side and as you can see now, the firehole door opens and closes very smoothly. I made sure the mounting bolts were tight and tested it again, and yes, there's nothing wrong with this, it's a perfect fit. What am I going to do with this turret? Well, I think I should throw it in the bin. But no, instead I will put it in a box marked random unserviceable items that could have been made a lot better than this and don't work anyway. I mean, just look at it, I'm not going to say any more about this object. I'm going to make a new turret and I'm going to make it from phosphor bronze and it will be much much better than this. This is a rattle fit in the hole and it relies on that horrible sealant stuff to seal it and of course when we first steamed it it was hopelessly leaky. So bad in fact that we terminated the steam test and removed it to reseal it with some Loctite 542. I'm going to replace this water gauge with a smaller unit but I need to make sure that it is in the right position for the firebox crown. The firebox crown is the upper part of the inner firebox and this must always be covered with water. If the firebox crown doesn't have water above it when there's a coal fire in the firebox then the boiler will soon be scrapped. So I'm looking at the water gauge very carefully. I need to make sure that the water gauge that I refit to this engine, which will be physically smaller than the other one, has the same dimensions, so that the bottom nut of the water gauge is above the firebox crown. In my humble opinion, the firebox crown on this particular boiler is a little bit on the high side, and when the boiler's in steam, if the water disappears below the bottom nut, then there will be a severe problem. Looking on the bright side though, this engine's going to have two injectors, it has an axle pump and a hand pump, so this is not going to happen. To conclude this video, I thought I would take this opportunity to show these beautiful loss wax casting lamps sat on their respective storage brackets at the side of the engine. And that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.